Thank you, Linda. A few things. Um, I want to remind everyone um, that this is a free event, um, but donations are gladly accepted. Um, these things do get costly, and there's a donation box over there. Feel free to throw in a five, a 10, 20, a 50, 100, whatever, whatever suits you. Um, also, I know that people from the Marsha P. Johnson Family Foundation are here, and I'll bring them up in a few minutes after Randy Wicker. Um, the whole idea of this came to us, um, came to us, I mean, Bob Foster and myself, as we're watching um, <clears throat> Hoboken Talks episode with Randy Wicker, um, which is fascinating and you should watch. And then in it, he reads a poem by Bobby Miller um, that was originally published in Longshot that um, got us talking. We should do something, you know. Anyway, Longtime Hoboken resident and legendary gay rights activist Randy Wicker began working for gay rights as a student in Austin, Texas in the mid 1950s. After graduating, he moved to New York City. In 1962, after hearing a broadcast on radio station WBAI, where psychiatrists discussed the sickness of homosexuality, Randy demanded and was given equal airtime. He also informed Newsweek, Variety, and the New York Times of this upcoming program. He and seven other gay men spoke about what it was like to be gay. The show was met with a range of responses, including a challenge to WBAI's FCC license to broadcast. The FCC ruled the show an exercise in free speech, making homosexuality a legitimate topic for broadcasting. In 1964, Randy famously led the first public gay protest at the New York City Army Induction Center after the confidentiality of a gay man's draft records were violated. These are merely two examples of his numerous legendary groundbreaking contributions to the movement over a 60 plus year span of time as an activist. Wicker met pioneering transgender activist Marsha P. Johnson in 1973 when he was working as a reporter <clears throat> for the LGBT journal, The Advocate. They became roommates somewhere around 1980 and were close until Marsha's untimely death in 1992, the details of which remain unresolved. Since 2009, Randy has been documenting and participating in the radical fairy communities in Tennessee and New York. Let's have a really good round of applause for Randy Wicker. The mic is yours. Is this stage wheelchair accessible? Because <laughs> I'm 84 years old. I, I really am overwhelmed by this program because it's raised so many issues. And I want to first sort of go through the list of quick catch-ups on what you have heard so far. Uh, John Heller's description of back in the days when the village was still the village and wild. I mean, they had they had gay pride day uh, and Halloween, the Queen. And the people, the people would get up on the balconies at Halloween and imitate the uh, uh, various groups that were singing, you know, the Marvels, the, uh, I forget all their names, but anyway, it was incredible back in those days. And uh, someone mentioned, uh, he marked about Marsh wearing bulbs in her hair. Yes, you went to Christmas time, she had these lights in her hair. I don't remember whether they knit or not, but it doesn't matter. You have a little thin Christmas tree lights all woven through your hair. And she went with this young girl that was visiting us to Saks Fifth Avenue. And then she walks in, the security guard was immediately on her because of course, oh my God, a black homeless person is and the arcade described her, you know. And of course, she went over and tampered all the perfume and all that, did nothing. They went to St. Patrick's Church, St. Patrick's Cathedral. And even there, the security guards watched her carefully because if you lit a candle for a decent person, you were supposed to put in a dollar or two. So uh, that was uh, 
I think, a, a little detail that you would enjoy knowing more about. Penny Arcade was, she's so East Village, so authentically East Village, she's wearing a Gem Spa t-shirt, which actually Gem Spa just recently closed. It was famous for its something sugar creams or something. It was like literally a landmark of the place. And she was talking, she did, this is oral history. I, I did a two hour interview with her. She's absolutely one of the most incredible personalities because she is sort of like her oral history. She brings together all the people. I began in East Village in the 1960s as a button activist with a psychedelic shop and uh, selling all the dump Johnson buttons and the anti-war buttons and the sex freedom league back and the gay buttons, you know, legalized prostitution buttons, everything. I've always been way ahead of my times because I left the gay movement in 63 because I was tired of they were so backward and self-hating. I went to the Sex Freedom League to fight for legalized abortion. And uh, then I went, I was co I was the first listed editor of Lemar, legalized marijuana, but that's another part of my story, which I'm making, I'm now writing articles about and books about. But anyway, she did talk about uh, the, and the ballroom, that was so interesting. The ballroom, Marsha associated with people that you, when you met someone, I think I may have told this on the other program, you never knew where they were from. The thing that amazed me the most is she was a witness to some woman being beaten up in the past station sometime around in the year she died, 1992. And a few months later, the police department called me and wanted to know, talk to Marsha. I said, she's gone, she's deceased. And he said, well, she was one of two witnesses to this beating. We were gonna, they were gonna use her as testimony to, convict this felon, and I, he said the other witness, get this, was the maitre d' of Windows on the World. Windows of the World was a fantastic restaurant at the very top of the Twin Towers back in those days. So there's a case in point where Marsha is out hobnobbing around as, as she got with, with, with top, top tier people. But other times she'd be talking to crazy homeless people I once asked Willie, how come, she, how come you never know when you meet Marsha who she's going to be with? And he said, you see people walking along the street talking to themselves, throwing their arms around? I said, sure, you run the other way. Uh, he said, not Marsha. She just stand there and talks to them. She always meet people in their own place. And uh, what the, uh, so I thought that was sort of fun. Boy, has, has East Village gotten gentrified? I mean, talk about horrible gentrification is unbelievable. No one can afford to live anywhere in Manhattan, period. Now they've all moved to Brooklyn, is one of the new epistemics of art and culture because nobody can afford Manhattan rents, or some adventures have gone up to Upper West Side or Harlem is still more affordable than the rest of Manhattan. The, uh, they were talking about she, not a pronoun. Uh, I thought that uh, Sissy, I believe was the name, is she talked about Marsha being resurrected as a gay activist, as a gay activist, but also as a transgender person. She wasn't a transgender person, that's true. What I think people don't realize is there's a spectrum of gender, gender and I would call Marsha a gender fluid person who as a persona, as a personality, though, was always feminine. And one of the reasons I mention that is, you know, Hoboken is, if you want to really meet the real Marsha, for God's sakes, everyone's seen David France's movie uh, called Death and Life of Marsha P. Johnson, which is a decent thriller. Why, how did she die? Who killed her? All that. But here it's for free on YouTube. Pay it no mind. Pay it no mind. The Life and Times of Marsha B. Johnson. And what did Marsha say in that movie? Marsha. I, I didn't come to the Stonewall until 2 o'clock in the morning. It wasn't in that movie. It was another interview done in my apartment. At 1.30, the fire was already going in Stonewall when I got there. Now, uh, somebody's talking about how she supposedly, her role in the Stonewall movement has some, so, some people question. Because somewhere in the first, in this, actually in this one, David Carter had two quotes in the thing, and Michael Cassino 
put the two together, I'm having reading, and it said that one member of GAA, this is why you don't have hearsay by a really good documentarian, one member of GAA said to another that Marsha was the first one to throw her shot glass in the mirror when the cops came in and said, I'm not going to take this anymore. And there were actually a couple of people that did doctoral theses called the shot glass heard round the world. <laughs> I mean, imagine if that was your doctoral thesis and that was the point. I mean, I didn't have any verification one way or the other, but recently someone went through an old tape that they did in my apartment, and the way he initially introduced it, when I interviewed Merchant Randy Wicker in his middle-class business and went over to Hoboken, I hardly expected to find a drug-addicted uh, black prostitute sitting on his, a transvestite prostitute sitting on his couch, and I told him, boy, you are so wrong, because Marsha never used drugs. That was one of the amazing things about her. She was too fragile to use drugs. She was, she was very religious. In this movie, you'll hear her talk about how she married Jesus Christ at the age of 16 and didn't even know about sex and the some boy put, put his Johnson between her legs and it got all gooey. But then the other thing that I've discovered, I find people are doing research on Marsha. There's a, a group called uh, uh, Tourmaline who's doing a book for Random House out next of uh, spring. And it's going to be a really deeply researched, excellent book. And they found things like I actually got access to see a video when Marsha's talking about she was went into the military. Actually, I thought it was a, it's actually it was the Navy. And Marsha joined as the Navy. You know, there's a whole world out there to explore, right? But about two months in or six weeks in the Navy, I imagine Marsha in tight whites. That would be so funny. But she's in the Navy, and she's still married to Jesus Christ. She hasn't run away from home and hit the hard life in New York City. And somebody grabs her buttocks. And what does righteous, good bride of Christ do? She slugs him. I don't know whether it was a commanding officer or whether it was just another recruit. So what happens? Miss Marsha, who's always like, she's always a female personality. She... They call her up before, they say, why did you slug this other recruiter, whoever she slugged? It was another member of the military. Now, if you were gay, they would give you a dishonorable discharge. You'd be marked for life. You couldn't get teaching license. You know, there's a stain on your record forever, getting forever being dishonorably discharged, especially. But Miss Marsha simply said, I slugged him because he put his hand on my buttocks. And she got an honorable discharge in the military. Oh, Miss Marsha, they must, I just think what those, those officers must have thought when they heard this case. They must have just been, just saying, oh my God, this is such an obvious flaming faggot. <laughs> you know, this is, well, what do we do? Oh, get, just get rid of him. Here, honorable discharge, bye-bye. They probably didn't say girl, they wouldn't do that in the military. So anyway, so that, that book is gonna come out and they've checked every, uh, every factor they could. I don't know how well written it's going to be, but it's going to be a landmark when it comes to act, to accuracy. Uh, oh, when they say uh, um, that she was a public, uh, you get into this uh, gender, these arguments about whether or not she was involved, if, whether she was a founding member of the gay gay movement, which some people question. Actually, she was because of this. She got down to the stone wall at 1.30. Sylvia Rivera, who sometimes featured in Duberman's book as being the one that led the riot. It was sleeping off an overdose, not an overdose, sleeping off heroin in Bryant Park. We don't, don't know for sure what time she got down to this village, but I'm sure if you go to sleep at 12.30 or one o'clock in Bryant Park, I don't know how long you sleep. When you have heroin, you're sleeping on the public park, but I'm sure the minute she got up and walked out to the Times Square area where it's filled with all these drag queens and everything else, Immediately she heard that there was a riot going on in the village, and I'm sure that Sylvia went right down. Now, whether she got there before sunrise, but the main thing is that she and Marsha got down there and were involved in that. And then the question was, was this going to be a one-night event? But there were some activists there, like Craig Rodwell from the Mattachine, which I had been a member of, was even like a secretary in 1965, said, we have to keep this going. So they went around putting up posters and, and stuff, and Marsha and Sylvia had nothing better to do. So they joined them, keeping the fight alive. 
But of course, when they finally got together with the radical left gang liberation front, it was all consensus. They were all like, you know, they wanted to have the connect with the Black Panthers. The lesbians didn't like that because the Panthers said women should serve coffee. And also, uh, so Marsha was even with the sit-in. They're going to put a plaque over on the building where she actually sat, slept in with the GLFers that had actually had an occupation going on at NYU. Now that's going to be a historic landmark because I know someone that worked at NYU that's working on that. And uh, so she was involved because then once they got GAA going, both and also generally speaking, cisgendered men, gay men, are really, and I was one of them. I, I was a transphobe when I was young because I read uh, Christine Jorgensen's biography. And they said, why don't you just have sex with a man as a man? Why have a, a sex change operation? She said, oh, I couldn't do that. That would be an awful sin. That's against my religion. So I came to the false conclusion, we never heard of anything like gender identity in those days, that Marsh said these were poor, guilt-ridden homosexuals who were going around castrating themselves just to fit into society. So I was not only a, 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 a transphobe, I was an ardent transphobe. The first time I met Marsha was when they had actually rescued her, GAA, this is a few years later, had rescued her from the mental hospital at Bellevue where they had taken a group of men of gay activists and surrounded her and got her out through an elevator. And Marsha's sitting on the couch. She's sweet. She's gentle. She's obviously no threat to anybody. She had been taken in because she was pulling the moon to the earth when this on her house in the street, but fortunately for we would not be here today if the police hadn't saved Earth by getting Marsha off of the Houston Street into Bellevue before the moon hit the Earth. But that's the way I met her. And I got to know her later. Uh, I had an adopted son named Willie who ran the streets with Marsha. And I met him at a burlesque hall, a male burlesque show. And he told me, uh, he had, I said, I was active with Madison. And he said, oh, I was president of gay youth in Baltimore at the age of 16. He was 18, 19 then. And he said, I run around the village. I hang out with Marsha. And I told him, I don't know that you really want to hang out with somebody like Marsha, you know. And what finally he moved in and I had an extra room. He, was, he made you laugh all the time. He was a comedian, just un, not so gorgeous, but absolutely a incredible comedian and manipulator. So he said to me, let Marcia sleep here. Uh, it's cold tonight. And I said, well, she likes to sleep on the, she, she'll sleep on the floor. She'll sleep on the floor. So I, I thought this must be a lie. It turns out she did like sleeping in the floor because she had a bullet near her spine they couldn't take out. So sleeping on the floor it caused it not to act up. She moved into my house sometime in 80 or 81 and was there until her death in 1992. And she was a house mother of my extended gay family. And uh, I think that's a, uh, a, a very lovely thing. I, it's interesting that she likes Larry Miller's first poem, which had so much of the wild stuff. But as far as I know, no, I'll take one thing back. I never don't remember Marsha even smoking the joint with us when we were smoking pot. Because I stopped smoking pot because if I had it in the safe, they would start working my nerves for it. Oh, come on, oh, come on. You have it, give us some pot, right? But Marsha never really partook of pot. I don't remember her drinking. But once somebody left her $2,000, she went out to a club, and the next day, she was all beaten up. Her teeth were broken. They almost killed her. And I said, what happened? And Willie really said, well, you know, Marsha usually doesn't have any money. But she went to the anvil, and she had money because this guy had left her $2,000. She had to wait about six weeks for the check to clear before she could get it. But she went out. Someone must have given her some drugs. Maybe that was acid or something like that because I couldn't believe that anybody would brutalize and almost kill Marsha. And uh, so anyway, I don't want to take up too much of your time. The, uh, uh, she never took hormones as far as I know. I say that because I've known people that took them and quit, and usually there's an enlarged nipple. But I never heard Marsha take hormones. She never talked about being a woman trapped in a man's body. That concept wasn't really there at that time either. But she was always a female. She was not, she was not a person that fit into any categories. And, you know, I understand why people take their identity and the refusal of society to recognize their identity so much, you know, whether it's he, him, she, her, or, or they, them. I find using them, as a, I find that very hard to use because it's a plural. And 
I personally am a member of Join the Radical Fairies. So you have to pick a name in Radical Fairies. I first picked Randy Dandy because I like to dress up. I just discovered an old man at 67. I discovered male glamour. And I said, you know what? I like the name Itsy. So my pronouns, I have a, my own category and I just love it. I was mad at the, a guy over at NYU had a social the other night for filmmakers and he put he, he, him on my card. I said, you know, I didn't even notice it at the time. Don't you know my females are it that? Get that straight. So I'm the it. No one else wants to be the it. I'm the champion it. And I can tell you also, I'm, I have a lot of Neanderthal genes, but I, I think I covered that pretty well in the other program. Getting back to the, the uh, uh, Lenape land, unless I'm mistaken, I looked up to Lenape. Hoboken and a lot of Jersey City and Manhattan. So we're all living on occupied Lenape land. And I'd like to get the people working with me to get rid of General Sheridan's statue in Stonewall National Park over there off of the Stonewall. He's famous for the saying, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. He committed genocide against the Native Americans. He nearly exterminated the bison until there were 800 left or something in, in Yosemite Park. And then Teddy Roosevelt gave him a face-saving thing of going and saving the bison so they didn't go extinct. But we shouldn't have let him go to a Civil War battlefield where he fought the good fight against the South and the war against slavery. That's where the man deserves to be recognized, but not in the center of a society that includes two-spirit people. And two-spirit people were accepted among many Indian tribes, and people don't seem to be aware of that. And I've met, I've met indigenous and Native Americans who I've talked to about the two-spirit thing, and they happen to be two-spirit people. And they said, well, you know, a lot of American tribes are, have absorbed the values that were taught to them by the Christian missionaries and all that. And now they're sort of, they don't want to talk about two-spirit. In other words, within their own communities, within their own Native American communities, they face discrimination and exile. Uh, yeah? I, yeah, I am, I am, okay. One last thing. I always told people that uh, I was going to show you the Time Magazine with the article about her in it and some other things, but mainly, uh, I, in 1992, when Marcia died, I tell people, I was a honky, I tell black people especially, I was a honky without a family until this wonderful black family in Elizabeth, the Michaels, adopted me and started inviting me out for Thanksgiving or summer fairs or any, any holiday. So I had a home to go. I had no, no living relatives left. And they were the most magical experiences of my life. And the next person you're going to read, it, meet is Al Michaels. And Al Michaels, actually at one of those Thanksgiving parties, sat me down and I'd been putting off getting a computer forever. And he introduced me to, to the, uh, community, and I think it's interesting to notice also that Marsha may have not legally changed her name, <laughs> but the Michaels family has changed their name for Marsha because they call themselves now the Marsha P. Johnson Foundation because Marsha has become this incredibly famous glowing comet of love in the sky. And I'm really anxious to hear Al Michaels tell us about the fabulous campaign they have going to build a memorial to Marsha in Elizabeth and how they originally people were trying to cause trouble among the between the Italian and the black communities in that town. And they had thousands, even BBC covered it. And the family took back control and said, no, we want our, our memorial in downtown right by city hall. And he's arranged that to happen. And I hope to God you'll find a way to give the families direct support at the Marjorie family foundation.org. They have, we have a wedge web page on, on Facebook, and I'm sure he'll tell you more about that because they deserve the respect. Thank you. Okay, Randy just did a much better job than I ever could do of introducing um, the Marsha P. Johnson Family Foundation members. Um, will you please come up for a minute just so we can acknowledge you? One of you is Al. Al. 
and you are pleasure. Can you just tell them a little bit about? Uh, what? First of all, I want to thank everyone involved with this program, everyone who attended this program, uh, for celebrating the life of Marsha. Uh, we, as a family, decided that we want to carry on Marsha's legacy. And the way you do that is by doing what Marsha did. Marsha was always giving, always caring, always making sure that you had some, you know, you were never hungry. She gave you the clothes off her back. And uh, they tried, like Randy said, they had a campaign to remove a Christopher Columbus statue in Elizabeth. And we were all behind it and they wanted to put up a Marsha statue. We said, yeah, Marsha deserves a statue in her hometown. But we come to find out is the statue is in and was provided by the Italian community. We don't want to be a part of that. Marsha should have her own space. So we found a plot right in the middle of City Hall, in the middle of, of the town, across the street from an alternative school. All right, it's called Freedom Trail. So the kids from the school can actually see the statue of Marsha that we planned on building. We have the plot, we have everything. We just have to raise the money now for the first trans statue in the world, not even in America, in the world. And uh, Marsha deserves that honor. And we hope you people can get the word out you know, if you have, you can give, you can give, but if you can't, just get the word out. Because I feel everyone says you should go to these corporate community, you know, corporations and stuff. Marsha and Sylvia weren't about that. They were about the people. They were grassroots. If every person, this is my feeling, if every person who was affected by Marsha, Sylvia, Stormy, etc., gave one dollar, we could put this statue up tomorrow. It's simple as that. Simple as that. So. We'll give you our business cards. We got cards. Uh, thank you again. We hope you can uh, contribute, and we want to see the statue up. Thank you very much.